everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. I'm a hands-on software architect and also the founder of developer2architect.com. In today's lesson, number 92, we'll talk about understanding hybrid architectures. In my book, Fundamentals of Software Architecture, that I wrote with Neil Ford, we kind of devoted a chapter to each of these architecture styles. As a matter of fact, uh, some of my lessons, I talk about each of these architecture styles individually. However, in most cases, we tend to form hybrid architectures. And in this lesson, I wanted to just show you some of those hybrid architectures, but also some of the implications of when it comes to the star ratings that we've introduced in our book. And so when we take a look at some common hybrid architectures, uh, some of the more common ones are, for example, an event-driven microkernel architecture, where we take the microkernel architecture and utilize messaging or events uh, between the core system and those plug-in components. As a matter of fact, uh, we could also have a microkernel microservices architecture, where each plug-in component can actually be a microservice separately deployed in a container. Service-based microservices is probably one of the more common hybrid architectures, one that's very, very well-suited, especially when migrating from a monolithic architecture style. Event-driven microservices is also a common hybrid where um, the communication to and between services, we leverage event-driven architecture. As a matter of fact, a lot of use cases with event-driven microservices with regards to data pumps, eventual consistency and broadcasting to other services. Space-based microservices is also another hybrid that's very, very powerful with a, where the processing unit within space-based architecture actually becomes a separately deployed unit of software, a microservice doing one thing really, really well. This is a very well-suited hybrid um, just because of the volume of data in the cache uh, that exists within space-based architecture. And finally, event-driven space-based architecture where we do have space-based architecture with caching, but we were leverage, leverage events and messaging to be able to communicate between processing units as well as the data pumps to the database. You know what I'd like to do is actually, and maybe I'll spend a, a future lessons actually diving into some of those. As a matter of fact, uh, let's dive into event-driven microkernel just to give you an example of the analysis and the trade-offs that go in when forming hybrids, especially with the star ratings. Because what we're going to do is we're going to combine event-driven architecture uh, along with microkernel to create an event-driven microkernel architecture. And when we do that, the core system communicates to the plugins through events and messaging. As a matter of fact, if we take a look at the star ratings, which we identified in our book, The Fundamentals of Software Architecture, uh, we can see all of these various illities that are supported in those corresponding star ratings by microkernel and also uh, those from event-driven. And when we form a hybrid, we can actually do an analysis to see what we're gaining, but also what we may be losing. And that's what I want to show you in this lesson. And so five stars is the best, the best movie in the world. One star is the worst. <laughs> and so um, one star implying that that illity or that architecture characteristic really is not supported well by that architecture style. Um, five stars means that it's one of its best features. And so when we start to take a look at forming this hybrid of event-driven microkernel where we communicate to the plugin components through events, um, let's take a look at all of these illities and what we gain and what we lose. From a maintainability standpoint, we really don't gain or lose anything by leveraging event-driven architecture. In other words, um, it becomes the protocol and the event, um, but the, pr the plug-in components are still separate, independent. Uh, so in some ways, we really don't gain much uh, by combining that. However, cost, well, we end up noticing losing a couple of stars off of the microkernel architecture. Um, so now we're starting to incur more cost in terms of longer development times, potentially, as well as the cost of uh, the broker and licensing and stuff. Um, from a deployability standpoint, though, we do gain actually a star on microkernel. Um, this is primarily because deployment, if we're changing a plugin component that's now separately deployed and accessed through messaging, we get a better decoupling 
of these plug-in components from the core system, and that allows just that one plug-in component to have to be deployed. And so we actually do gain a star from deployability. As a matter of fact, um, from an elasticity standpoint, uh, let's take a look here, we actually gain one star. Now you might think, well, wait a minute, if the math is correct, um, shouldn't we have go from one star to four stars, uh, shouldn't that really be more like three? And the problem with elasticity is the fact that we do gain a little bit because that Q provides some back pressure point um, and also asynchronicity. However, all the requests still have to go through the core system. And so that core system still becomes the limiting factor um, from an elasticity standpoint. However, we do gain a star primarily because now oh, we can do more async so that we're not in that core system as long. Um, evolvability actually also gains an extra star. We had three stars before, now we gain an extra one star. Um, because adding additional functionality on is a lot easier because now I don't have that deployment uh, of usually a monolithic microkernel architecture. Um, from a fault tolerance perspective, let's see what happens here because the microservices has one star for fault tolerance because it's usually deployed as a monolith. However, five stars for event-driven. What do you suppose this result would be? Surprisingly enough, no change in here. And the reason, again, is because that core system is our fault tolerant. That's our single point of failure. Microkernel requires all requests to come into that core system first, then sending messages to each of the plugins. And so from a fault tolerance perspective, we're still dependent on that core system. And so it still remains at one star. However, performance, we do gain one extra star because again of asynchronicity. Um, we don't necessarily have to wait for the request to come back from that plugin. As a matter of fact, I can run several plugins in parallel as a matter of fact, using that asynchronous messaging in a multicast to be able to do multiple activities at once within that core system. A scalability like elasticity only really gains an extra star. Uh, we get a little bit better scalability again because we have asynchronous behavior now in communication with the plugins. And so again, I might not have to wait for an answer right away. I may be able just to do a fire and forget message and therefore I'm not in that core system as long. And so it can handle more requests. Um, however, simplicity, I do end up losing a star on this. It becomes more complicated in our overall system. And finally, testability. Mm, let's see what happens with this. Ooh, I end up losing a star now. Yeah. And so testability is three stars within the microkernel architecture. However, once we add event driven in, now it reduces it down because testing event driven architectures is hard everyone and so it does limit that in terms of possibly introducing some bugs in our system and also that completeness and ease of testing so if we boil this down and summarize it um, event driven microkernel is a, is a very popular hybrid however what we really are gaining are some level of deployability a little bit more on elasticity and scalability um, good evolvability and a uh, little bit better performance because we now can slowly start removing some bottlenecks within our system. Uh, however, uh, the price we pay for those little tiny increases is really um, a bump in cost, simplicity, and testability. And now, by analyzing these, we can determine whether this is a viable hybrid or not. But the key point of this lesson is really to show you when we do form these hybrids, um, you can't just do straight math with each of the star ratings. We actually have to analyze uh, each of those illities. Um, again, uh, the good example is the fault tolerance aspect um, to make sure that the trade-offs of the pluses uh, balance the trade-offs of the minuses. And so, again, for more information about these particular architectures in their a complete form, uh, I would point you over to our book, The Fundamentals of Software Architecture, which we wrote on, in February of 2020. I wrote this with Neil Ford. And in there, we devote a chapter to each architecture style. I believe there's eight different architecture styles that we do uh, devote an entire chapter to, so we can really go in depth into there. Um, also, uh, I do a lot of workshops and trainings uh, in these days. Uh, they're, they're all virtual, <laughs> but you can go certainly go uh, to my training page on Developer to Architect to find out other classes and stuff that I do teach. 
And finally, Neil Ford and I have a free um, architecture Q&A forum we call Foundations Friday Forum, uh, which is at the last Friday of every month. And you can go over to my website, developertoarchitect.com, click on Forum, uh, or um, the uh, upcoming events page um, to be able to register for that. Um, but that's a fr free 30-minute Q&A forum that we do. So. Anyways, um, hopefully that gave you a better understanding of hybrid architectures and how to analyze those. And so, again, this is Lesson 92 and of Software Architecture Monday. And uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Stay safe and stay tuned in two weeks for another lesson in software architecture. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.